Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of Tom McNaught, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, the members of the Foundation's board of directors who are here with us this evening, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for joining us this evening. Let me first acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forum's lead sponsor, Bank of America, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, Raytheon, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, the Boston Globe and WBUR. I also thank our special sponsor, Bingham McCutcheon, for this and other forums related to civil rights issues as part of our new initiative, JFK 50, Justice for All. How honored we are to have Harry Belafonte with us here this evening, a man who Henry Louis Gates once described as radical before it was chic, and remained so long after it wasn't. <laughs> An immensely successful entertainer and worldwide star, Harry Belafonte, in the words of Bob Dylan, no less, never took the easy path, though he certainly could have. In his memoir, Mr. Belafonte writes how his unique childhood fostered in him, quote, a lifelong camaraderie with those living in poverty, and I never stopped feeling a member of that tribe. He credits his tenacious mother for urging him not to allow injustice to go unchallenged and went on to dedicate his life to social causes, from bailing out his friend Martin Luther King Jr. from the Birmingham jail to helping to organize the March on Washington, from initiating the star-studded We Are the World single to leading the American effort to end apartheid, including hosting former South African President Nelson Mandela on his triumphant visit to the United States, which included a stop at this library from being named as one of the first cultural advisors to the Peace Corps to serving as a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador, all of which I'm sure we'll hear more about this evening. In a recent interview, he recounted that he's often asked, when as an artist did you decide to become an activist? I say to them, I was long an activist before I became an artist. I'm reminded of the words John F. Kennedy used to describe Robert Frost, whose contributions to our country, JFK suggested, quote, was not to our size, but to our spirit. Not to our political beliefs, but to our insight. Not to our self-esteem, but to our self-comprehension. If sometimes our greatest artists have been the most critical of our society, it is because their sensitivity and their concern for justice, which must motivate any true artist, makes them aware that our nation falls short of its highest potential. Mr. Belafonte's memoir, My Song, is on sale in our bookstore, and he'll sign copies at the conclusion of our forum. Our moderator this evening is Liz Walker, a native of Little Rock, Arkansas. Ms. Walker served for two decades as one of Boston's most trusted news anchors and is currently a minister at the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Jamaica Plain. She also hosts the weekly TV show, Better Living with Liz Walker, and is a documentary filmmaker and humanitarian activist focusing on international education women's issues and the crisis in the Sudan. Allow me two final and brief observations about Mr. Belafonte's memoir. The first is the wonderful description of his friendship with Sidney Portier, who he describes as his first friend in life. Each of us, he writes, were skinny, brooding, and vulnerable, and each was as unlikely as the other to become a future star. Before their careers took off, they shared various get-rich schemes, which included serving as a stand-up comedy team until, quote, we realized we weren't funny. <laughs> we started going to the theater once or twice a week, splitting the cost of a single ticket. One of us would go in for the first half, come out at intermission, I love that. and pass the stub along with a plot summary to the other, who would be the lucky one to see the second half. I was moved by reading about Mr. Belafonte's childhood, his first successes as an actor and a singer, and his early commitment to issues of social justice and the extraordinary friendships he made in the initial years of his career with the likes of Paul Robeson, Eleanor Roosevelt, James Baldwin, Marlon Brando, and Robert F. Kennedy, mm. 
who he describes as the political leader he most admires for speaking from his heart and moral center. And then at the end of the book, I was equally affected by Mr. Belafonte's most recent life stories, the wisdom garnered through his years of self-reflection, and his heartwarming account of his marriage in 2008 to his wife, Pam, who is here with us tonight. The world is a better place, Mr. Belafonte, for all you have done. And those of us fortunate to be here this evening and to have seen the benefits of your work in this new century, we are the lucky ones to have been past the torn ticket stub from those who've come before us and to have witnessed the second half of your long life of engagement, steadfast commitments, and their impact on our world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Liz Walker and Harry Belafonte. This is an honor. <laughs> Mr. Belafonte, this is so very exciting for me. It has been said that you have packed enough life in your 84 years for 10 people, an actor, a singer, a social activism that actually did change the world. So sitting here with you and having this conversation is indeed an honor and a privilege for me, not only because of your iconic status in the world, but the fact that we're in this place and your relationship with this family, our family, the Kennedys. There's so many places to start, but I thought, why not start there? You are in the midst of the civil rights movement. You're immersed there. You're a confidant of Martin Luther King Jr. And the candidate, John F. Kennedy, reaches out to you. Tell me how you met the president. Before I do that, I would like to just express my great sense of uh, delight in sharing this evening with you, Thank you. and uh, the exchange we're going to have, and to have met the chancellor of the university, and certainly our host, the Kennedy Center. Uh, the, the opportunity to speak is really, for me, quite quite even an event. I had not thought that uh, I would have lived long enough to see yet another marvelous rebellion perking on the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> and that there would still be an opportunity for me to be able to speak to many of the young men and women who make up the heart of the current rebellion, not just here in the United States, but in other parts of the world as well. And coming here uh, to the Kennedy Center, uh, to the Kennedy Library, uh, carries a lot of memory. When I first heard of John Kennedy, it was in his service as a senator and a person from whom we had expectations that perhaps he would be better than many we were experiencing. And that he did come from a family that appeared to be liberal on the edges, uh, but somewhere in the heart of who they were they kept eluding us in terms of what was this family and its mission. I was approached by a young man by the name of Harris Wofford, who was an African American, who was working for the Kennedy political machine. And he called me one day and said that uh, the young senator had expressed an interest in meeting with me. And uh, uh, when I pressed him for what was the motive, he just said, well, he believes that uh, he's misunderstood. He believes that there are many of us uh, in the black community that should hear him uh, more precisely than we had been hearing him, and that perhaps such an exchange might 
given us, give us another point of view about what we may be thinking of him. Uh, it was a little bit codified. Uh, he didn't come right out and say it, but what had happened at that very moment in time uh, was that a great American icon, a huge heroic figure by the name of Jackie Robinson, had become quite irritated with the Democratic Party and with the Kennedys. And he felt that in many ways, not only he personally, but also black people in general had been very much slighted by the party and slighted by uh, the Kennedys. Uh, and he therefore decided to step out and publicly endorse the opposition, which was Richard Nixon. This so, uh, was so unexpected, and at the time that was most strategic in the Democratic Party's attempt at trying to put together a platform and an agenda, they saw this as a serious uh, problem. In seeking solution, they concluded that they should hurry up and find out who could be the potential allies for the Kennedy machine and his uh, agenda, and that perhaps that would balance what was taking place with Jackie Robinson. Uh, I understand the game of politics, and there's some aspects of it that I find most difficult. Uh, how we uh, use people and how we use people to impose uh, thoughts and ideas on other people that may not necessarily be our own ideas and our own thoughts. The manipulation of it all. And when I met, uh, I told uh, that I would, I, I said that I would meet with John, he came to my apartment. It was at the end of a long day of campaigning in New Jersey for the New Jersey primary. And he came to the apartment at the end of that day and uh, began to put before me what he thought were the issues of the day affecting black people and what he thought he could do about making a difference. As he unfolded his thoughts and his ideas, I became more and more anxious at the fact that here was a young man running for the most powerful office in the world, speaking about the conditions of a people who made up so much of the history of this nation, and that he himself was evidencing so little knowledge mm. about us and our pain and our anguish and certainly very little understanding about our hopes and our desires. And as he went on into the evening, I told him that I just felt that uh, there was not very much more left for us to say to each other because I thought he was uh, missing the point. I said, looking for a celebrity to answer another celebrity was a game that I thought was not very, uh, not very forthcoming. Not the way I thought it should be if you're seeking to run the country. It's not a game of celebrities. It's a game of ideas and games, a game of our fundamental humanity. And to try to play the black community this way was in itself its own uh, insult was its own misguided approach. And I then evoked the name of Dr. King and told him what our little group, not so little, but it certainly was not as well known then, what we were setting out to do. And that if he really wanted to capture the hearts and the minds of African American community, it would do him well to be talking to those whom we have chosen to be our leaders and our voice in this struggle we were experiencing. Uh, the more I spoke of Dr. King, the more he evidenced absolutely no real in-depth 
knowledge about who this man was. And uh, I found that rather curious because we'd already engaged with Montgomery bus boycott. Mm -hmm. We were already in motion. A lot of stuff was going on. And for him to be so, uh, I, I wouldn't say he was indifferent. I would say that to be so uninformed uh, struck me as very curious. And I recommended to him that uh, what he needed to do was to find a way to access Dr. King. I would certainly put myself at his disposal if that's what he wished to do. And maybe from that approach, and meeting Dr. King, something could be hammered out that might be beneficial to the Democratic Party. Uh, and he indicated at the end of the evening that he would certainly look into that. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what that meant or where it would go, but I then began to look around at the Democratic Party and the Democratic machinery itself. And, uh, discovered that there was a young man by the name of Harris Wofford, who was a Quaker, who was very much caught up with the Kennedy family and in his own interest in peace and the peace movement, and that he could leverage an approach to the Kennedys that might be more uh, captivating for them to begin to take interest in Dr. King because Harris himself was very much involved in where Dr. King was going, and particularly in the issues of nonviolence. So all of these things began to pollinate. They began to brush each other and touch each other, and things began to escalate. At the end of the conversation, however, he said to me, I understand that you have committed to someone else, because I told him that I was for Adelaide Stevenson. And although the, the journey looked very uh, uh, unyielding, and I wasn't quite sure where we would go, we were nevertheless committed to Stevenson and what he stood for. And he said, well, if I win the primaries and I become the Democratic Party nominee, would you then come on board? And I said, only if I knew what the platform was and trusted where he would lead the Democratic Party. Much of my concern about the Democrats was to be revealed in what was going on so cruelly by the powers in the South that made up the Southern Dixiecrats, as they were called, and these vicious men uh, who made up the philosophy of the South, who worked very hard at passing laws that were so oppressive, and for them to be given so much leverage in this campaign uh, disturbed me. And that meant that somewhere along the line, those of us who were the victims of this kind of political uh, uh, juggling were going to pay the biggest price. Our issues will never be settled. You ended up making a commercial for the uh, ca president's campaign, which I believe we have here, and we're going to show them. Why, what changed for you before that? Uh, before we run that spot, what, what changed? What had happened at this moment that I'm speaking of in this time was that uh, Dr. King was arrested on a very minor charge having to do with a traffic violation. And he had been given a sentence some months earlier and it was given a kind of period of probation. And he had violated this probation by becoming involved in civil disobedience and by picketing and doing the things that he did in getting arrested, violated the probation. And the state of Georgia decided to sentence him then to the chain gang. Mm. And for us, that was an act of, of great horror. The idea of Dr. King on the chain gang in the midst of uh, all of these conflicts was a way to ensure that his safety was under severe attack, or would be, and that we had to at all costs get him off the chain gang. 
and at least, if it was an issue of justice, put him someplace where he would not be in harm's way. And we appealed both candidates, both to Nixon, in which a group of us, having a committee, appealed to Nixon, hoping that he would intervene. And also, the same appeal was made to Kennedy. And uh, Nixon just ignored us all together, didn't even answer a letter or a call. And the Kennedys, we discovered, were at least willing to wrestle with the moment. And in that context, with exchanges back and forth, Bobby Kennedy engaged with the hierarchy of the Georgia Democratic uh, State Party and negotiated a deal that got Dr. King hmm. off uh, the charge, off the chain gang. Uh, with that, it was expected that uh, Dr. King would endorse Kennedy. And the group of us who were strategists working in certain areas of the civil rights uh, campaign uh, thought that endorsing Kennedy was inappropriate. We knew very little about him. We did not know what his platform fully held for us, and that Dr. King's integrity and his independence was something that could not be sacrificed, even in circumstances such, and, such as this, unless we had greater proof and greater reason to believe that what we were about in our movement would be honored. And uh, it was agreed that there would be no endorsement by Dr. King. But in its place, what we would do would be to express publicly the appreciation of the black community and a lot of black leaders, including the King family. We took huge ads in newspapers around America, the most leading journals, expressing our deep gratitude to the Kennedys and to the Kennedy family for intervening in behalf of Dr. King and expressing our hopes that the Democratic Party would continue in this spirit. And we were going to endorse him. So instead of getting just Dr. King, he got 400 others, but did not get Dr. King. Uh, and in that context, I then uh, set out to do a series of ads and got on the campaign trail and worked for John Kennedy to become president. Let's look at that uh, ad. Hi. My name is Harry Belafonte. I'm an artist, and I'm not a politician. But like most Americans, I have a great interest in the political and the economic destiny of my country. I'm seated here with Senator Jack Kennedy. As a Negro and as an American, I have many questions, and I'm sure everyone does, about civil rights, about foreign policy, about the economy of the country, and about things that'll happen. And I want to make it very clear, Harry, that on this question of equality of opportunity for all Americans, whether it's in the field of civil rights, better minimum wages, better housing, better working conditions, jobs, I stand for these things. The Democratic Party under Franklin Roosevelt stood for them. I'm voting for the senator. How about you? Vote for a leader like Roosevelt. Vote for John F. Kennedy for president. There you go. There you go. And in the end, this ad ran a lot or ran a little bit, but certainly the African American ran very little. What happened? Well, they first aired the ad. Uh, it was absolutely amazing how ballistic uh, the Southern uh, ah. rulers uh, went. They were furious and uh, made all sorts of threats that if that ad ever ran again, uh, they would guarantee that uh, John would not be elected, and it just went on and on and on. And so they pulled it, mm. but not before it had a chance to air once. I think 
all, I only know of once. There may have been a second time, but there's certainly no more than wow. that. And it caused quite a stir in the South. And uh, I have to say that uh, the slim margin by which Kennedy won the election, one has to take into consideration that although you can't know one campaign or one group can lay claim to being the strategic reason for victory, all of us have a right to lay some claim that had it not been our presence doing what we did, it might have been a different story because the margin was so, so slim. very right. slim. The journey for you to this pivotal point in history began with a rather nomadic childhood, I understand. You grew up in New York, but you shuttled between New York and Jamaica. Tell us a little bit about your growing up that would lead to this powerful moment. I was born in New York, uh, uh, in Harlem, and uh, of immigrant parents. My mother was quite young, much too young to have been having children. And I was her firstborn. And in her, in her disillusionment about America and what she'd hoped to find when she came here, it all had eluded her. And when she started having children, she saw much of her life uh, uh, getting away from her. And my father, uh, who was a bit of a scoundrel, he, uh, he was very violent. Mm. He was an alcoholic, mm. a philanderer. And whenever we saw him, he was a seaman. He was always away. And whenever we did see him, it was never a moment that was filled with expectations of joy. It was, as a matter of fact, moments filled with great trepidation, with great anxiousness, because we had no idea when his alcohol and his violence would mix. And more often than not, when those things happened, my mother became the recipient of his violence. And uh, in this context, my mother found New York overwhelming, and that she thought that to her, to her best interest, and certainly the best interest of her two children, to take us back to the island where she was born and to be brought up by the community, the village in which she grew up, would be far more, uh, a far more responsible thing for her to do and to ensure our safety uh, more fully than she was, would have been able to ensure our safety in New York City uh, because there were no such things as a, uh, uh, easily found babysitters and uh, putting your children in the care of strangers was a very hard thing for her to do, which she had to do on so many occasions. So when she took us back to the island of Jamaica, uh, I saw her on occasion, mostly holidays, hmm. because I was there from the age of a year and a half when she took us, uh, took me, and then ultimately my brother. Uh, I stayed there until I was 12. And when I came back to the United States, it was at the dawning of the uh, conflict between England and Germany. And my mother uh, was like most people who were born in the colonies, concerned about uh, Germany's power. And certainly if Germany were to defeat England, she was concerned about what happened with the colonies, and therefore all of the citizens of the world that made up the British Empire. And so she brought us back to America. And from then on, I stayed here and uh, just lived the life yeah, of, yeah. Uh, of my history. A struggling life. Uh, uh, you dropped out of school at high school, I believe. First term high. I was uh, on my way to being 17. And uh, uh, academics had always overwhelmed me. 
I suffered from a disorder. My brain circuitry was really out of whack and it played havoc with my focus, my attention, my learning uh, capacity. Teachers were constantly frustrated at the fact that what I appeared to be never translated itself in terms of homework and diligence as a student. And as a matter of fact, each time I was taken out of a school to be put somewhere else, there was a great celebration at each school I left. <laughs> and, uh, and I was always kind of fascinated at the fact that I could cause such joy <laughs> by just leaving the scene. It was quite an experience. But uh, the problem that I had was many years later identified uh, as a, a disease to be called dyslexia. And my severe case of it really hampered my relationship to the world of academia. But Couldn't in the meantime, destiny steps in. 18, you're working as a janitor, and you get two tickets as part of uh, gratuity for good work, and that lands you at the American Negro. Tell us that story, Theodore. At the end of the Second World War, uh, I served in the United States Navy. And at the end of that war, I came out looking for reward, looking for some generosity to be accessed by those of us who served uh, that, the cause of the war and could find nothing except animosity, found a very uh, irritable America. Uh, black GIs in particular paid a terrible price because we came back with attitude. We came back with a sense of achievement and victory and that uh, there was to be a reward for the victors. And uh, black servicemen found no such generosity. We came back to laws that were more enforced than ever before that had to do with racial segregation. Uh, many black GIs were set upon and beaten. One in particular, a young man by the name of Isaac Woodard, who was a, a, a celebrated uh, soldier, uh, came back, mustered out in New Jersey on his way back to South Carolina to see his family, had gotten through the war without any harm, had done brave things. And uh, when he got down south, they told him to sit in the back of the bus. He refused to do that. They hauled him off the bus, beat him severely, mm. and gouged out both of his eyes mm. with the blunt end of a billy club. And word got around the nation and among black servicemen. And it was a peculiar time in the world, not just for us as black Americans who were on the road to becoming engaged activists, but we were also part of another global phenomenon. The war talked about democracy. It talked about putting an end to the beliefs and racial superiority as evidenced by Hitler and uh, uh, the pure Aryan brotherhood. And when we fought that war, we believed in everything about the rights of people and democracy and, and believed it, believed in Roosevelt, believed in Churchill, believed in everything, believed in the heroics of what we were doing and came back with these expectations and they weren't there. We had one of two options. One was to accept this newly escalated belligerence from the society at large, certainly from those who ran political and social affairs, or to take up the mood of rebellion, to take up the fact that we would change the conditions under which we live. We would challenge the system forever. Mm -hmm. And that uh, what was awakened in us was the inordinate number of men 
and women who are prepared to play that game, who are prepared to join and belong to organizations and to do things that many of us have never done before. The idea that there were forces around the country that wanted to fight for better wages, fight for more access, uh, was quite interesting. And we found ourselves with allies. And uh, the more we joined and the more we got caught up in the affairs of liberation, was the more the opposition exerted itself to the height of its power. And we were called communists, we were beat up, we were uh, demonized, uh, particularly blacks who sought to talk about the change of social patterns and behavior. Our greatest heroes, Paul Robeson, mm. uh, was beaten at peak skill and people rioted. Our government went after him and demonized him and took away his passport and uh, threatened institutions uh, and venues around the country that if they hired him, uh, there would be a price for them to pay. And they just sought to crush Paul. How did you, how did you meet Paul Robeson? You were already in the theater? Well, yes. Uh, that, uh, I'm getting to this answer that you gave me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, uh, in this campaigning uh, to be active against what we were experiencing, I lived up to the best parts of my skill. I was a janitor's assistant, and I could clean the best hallway, <laughs> make your staircases look polishing, spit clean, and I could stoke the boiler and get your hot water going, and I could haul the garbage. And, uh, in the midst of doing this work, uh, I did a repair in someone's apartment. And as a gratuity, they gave me two tickets to go to a community theater in Harlem. And I'd never been to the theater and didn't know quite what went on there. I'd been to music halls, the Apollo and other places, and saw the great musicians of the day that just absolutely delighted me and filled my soul with uh, joy. But, uh, uh, I had never seen a theater drama. And I went out of curiosity. And when the house lights went down and the curtains went up, it was really it was an epiphany. I, I was so struck by what I saw, these black men and women on stage in this little theater at the Schoenberg the Library in Harlem, and these artists were speaking the words of a skillful poet. And they were making people laugh and making people uh, anxious and manipulating the environment. And all with the use of words. Hmm. And all with this thing called theater. And I just knew that more than anything else in the world, I wanted to be part of this environment. Had no idea what I would, goals I would set for myself but I needed to be there, to be in this place. And I hung around and uh, long enough to become caught up in its, in its mechanisms. And at one point, he, they chose to do a play called Juno and the Paycock by an Irish playwright named Sean O'Casey. And looking around for somebody to play one of the characters in the play, they came in my direction. And, uh, uh, under the threat of being considered not a team player, I took this part expecting them to find somebody mm -hmm. who would qualify. So I took the play and went through the pains of hell trying to learn uh, the part, trying to read the text, and to do so from a writer who not only had the eloquence of Casey, but who wrote an Irish brogue. <laughs> and, uh, Fortunately for me, I could adapt my West Indian characteristics with the, with the patois of the Jamaica talk, which sounded so Irish anywhere, you know? <laughs> and before you knew it, this whole black cast speaking in this Jamaican dialect <laughs> was playing this incredible play 
about the Irish rebelling against the British. And uh, I enjoyed that <laughs> and enjoyed this place. And then on the third night of the play, in walked the Colossus. Wow. In walked a man named Paul Robeson. We all knew of him, but we didn't know him. And uh, he saw the play. And at the end, he stayed behind and talked with us. And uh, not only delighted us with his words, but inspired us with how he defined the world in which we were seeking to live. And he called us, he said, if you choose this mission to be in the arts and to be an artist, you have embarked on the most powerful force in our universe, art. He said, it's more powerful than religion. He said, we are the gatekeepers of truth. And he went on and on. And those who felt a little contentious on the idea that it was greater than the greatest force in the world would evoke religion. And he'd say, religion is sold because it is at the behest of artists that we've convinced the world of these great myths that run from the pages of the Bible, written by artists in our temples of worship, created by architects that incredible design and the beautiful mosaics and the painted glass windows and certainly what Mozart and Brahms and others have given us in the mass. If it had not been for all these forces in the arts, nothing could be as celebrated as religion is if it had not been for artists stepping into the space. Well, I thought it was a very fanciful interpretation <laughs> of everything and decided this is where I wanted to go. Uh, Having met Mr. Robeson that night, I then began to become more engaged in what he was doing and what he was saying. I went to rallies and things that he was a part of. And each time I went to these rallies, I made sure that I identified myself and expressed to him my great delight at being part of the struggle that he had taken on and that through him, I met other artists like John Killens and young writers and people. And then through them, began to meet people like Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Wow. And then I began to meet people like Eleanor Roosevelt. Wow. And in this, and these moments of great coincidence, I began to meet all these people that had things to do, had ideas and thoughts that deeply struck me. And uh, I saw purpose in who they were and what they spoke about. And this meant now that uh, the, my most severe challenge had been put upon me because, God damn it, I'd have to start to learn how to read. <laughs> and uh, I'd have to read a lot of stuff to just get in the same room with these people, let alone engage in debate. And I think uh, one of the stories that most struck my friend, Dr. King, when we took up with each other was, uh, Dr. Du Bois uh, was one of the first people that was given to me to read. And I used to feel terribly self-conscious that um, I kept asking these rather sophomoric, simplistic questions from men and women who were far more endowed with history and with what they were doing than I. And, uh, I decided that uh, to get a, around their disdain or their animus for my, for my lacks, uh, I, I noticed something that I would read a passage, and in this passage, I would uh, uh, see a number. And if I looked at the foot of the page, the number indicated that whatever Dr. Du Bois was speaking about was derived from the source that was notated at the foot of the page. And in my need to catch up with the world at large, I said, I don't have to talk to these guys. I just got to read these books and see where Dr. Du Bois, had. they revered him so. I thought, I had to just catch up. And uh, uh, I went to the library. And uh, 
told uh, the lady who was the librarian that I would like to get a, these books. And she looked at the list and she said there was much too many uh, that I could take a few, but not the number that I asked for. I said, well, look, uh, so I should pay it on my list. And I said, let me make things very easy for you. Forget all the titles I have. Just give me everything you have on Ibid. <laughs> uh, somewhat nonplussed by this request, she pointed out that there was no such an author. And she happened to have been white in her late 60s, I would say, or mid-60s, beautiful flax and white hair. And I really took off on her, saying, how can you tell me there's not such a writer? Uh, our black educators have quoted. And I went on and on, and the woman just looked at me absolutely nonplussed with this thing in front of her making these claims. And I walked away. Now, when I told the people in my circle about the story, they did exactly what everybody else did. <laughs> they laughed. When I told this to Dr. King, I don't, it was, the moment was caught on film. And I don't remember ever seeing Martin with so deep a belly laugh <laughs> as he evoked when I told him this story about Ibid. It was just right up his alley. Uh, but these were some of the nuances, yeah. some of the things that, uh, the walls I bounced off of. The most important thing about this period were the people who were revealed to me, sure. who had purpose, who had life. And more often than not, they found motivation for my being in their midst and things that I could do. And when I took up my interest as an actor, leaving the American Negro Theater, knowing that I needed to learn much more. I went to the New School of Social Research, and the drama department had been taken over by a, a German by the name of Erwin Piscotta, who was well known for uh, the Dada movement in Germany, and certainly working with Max Reinhardt and the, the Epic Theater, which in those days, in the early 30s, was quite the force in Western theater and Western playwriting. When he came to the United States as an exile, political exile from the Nazis, he went to the New School, opened up a drama department, and in my own research discovered that that was where I needed to go to become more immersed in the deeper nuances of the art of drama and acting. And uh, when I got to the first days of my class, I looked around the room and saw a bunch of people, my peers, uh, who just didn't quite look like they belonged in that room. I kind of mused to myself that these people want to be actors. And uh, not understanding that I looked as peculiar to them as they did to me. And, uh, the group was made up of the following classmates. Marlon Brando, Walter Matthau, Rod Steiger, B. Arthur, uh, Tony Schwartz, or Tony Curtis, Bernie Schwartz, and uh, a number of others, just to name a few. And for our early years in the theater, I bounced around the room with great joy and adventure with these as my classmates, not ever suspecting that this, this one class alone would have turned out such a powerful force and unleash it on American culture, what, what these men and women did, not only as actors, but all the writers, Robert Penn Warren and people who anointed our school with uh, the rights to take their books and transform them into plays and to meet up with uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and the early existentialist movement and do his plays in our school, all because wow. of Piscotta and how 
much he was respected. So we had a heavy dose of not only the study of the art, but immersed in the power of social drama. Right. Because everything in our school was geared towards social art and the dynamics of art in the service of social and human need. So as we did plays and we did things, it was always around what is it saying? What does it inspire? What does it influence? What do you do with the hearts and minds of people who are now at your disposal to juggle and to, none for me? <laughs> <laughs> We've got plenty. Now uh, you, is this, you met Sidney Poitier, not at the New School, but at the ANT, or tell me how you met the man you call your first friend. Well, when I walked into the American Negro Theater with the gratuity, and I looked around, uh, one of the people who walked in almost exactly at the same time that I did, same day, wound up with the same dilemmas and the same confusions as myself was this young man named Sidney Poitier. And he was very, very introverted and very quiet and terribly repressed and didn't say very much. And all of us in the group, Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee wow. and others, saw him as fairly strange. <laughs> now, the only people I knew of who were so fairly strange were members of my family. <laughs> and what made them so strange was the fact that uh, a lot of their daily work were doing things that were outside the law. As a lot of immigrants had done, they got very much caught up in bootlegging and in the numbers business. And, and the Caribbeans and the numbers business, there's, a, there's an empathy here. There's a, there's a synergy between the two. Because we brought the numbers business to America. Most people don't know that. Yeah. The Irish and the Italians take all the credit for what they have. <laughs> <laughs> we give them a little slack so they can look good. But uh, one day I said to Sydney when we were down in the bottom of the stage, emptying some trunks and trying to clean up a mess and find costumes and stuff for our play, I looked at him and the silence was thick. And I said to him, have you been in jail? And I never, ever, again, ever saw a look of fury in the face of a fellow human being as I saw in Sydney when I asked him that question. He popped. I mean, he really got uptight. And I thought I struck a chord. I said, damn, first shot, I got a winner here. Something's wrong. <laughs> and he just said, what made you ask that question? I said, well, you know, you're kind of strange, man. You don't say much to anybody, and everybody's wondering who and what you are. And he said, none of your business who and what I am. And if you got to think of me as something, why would you think of me as a convict? And I said, well, nothing else in your evidence is something else I could have chosen. I just wonder who you are. From that moment on, Sidney and I had this edge. We became very, very close. We became very competitive. We discovered that we were just eight days apart in age. Mm. He was born in Florida of West Indian parents. I was born in New York of West Indian parents. He went to the Army. I went to the Navy. He came out about the same time I did and couldn't find work and couldn't read and couldn't write. And the scenario just played itself out with such great similarity that we just saw this in each other. Now comes the real rub. When we were given a play to do uh, called uh, Days of Our Youth, he, I got the part, and he was given the role of my understudy, which is fine with me. <laughs> I know he'd never get a chance to exercise 
the ability to play the part, I didn't intend to miss any performances, except this one night. I'd paid somebody to take over my duties as a janitor's assistant. I need to haul the garbage, need to keep everything on point, because that was my living. And I didn't make any money in this theater, bouncing from play to play and actor to actor. And so uh, I had to pay somebody a dollar and a half to make sure that every night at 8 o'clock you're going to be there to pull the dumb waiters. Those days we had dumb waiters. People in Boston know about dumb waiters, but it was really in New York where they had a good run. I mean, run these dumb waiters up, get the garbage, pull it down, empty, clean the pails, send them back up. And this, I could not jeopardize that job. And on this particular night, the guy who did my errands for me, who did the job for me, told me he couldn't make it. And it was about six o'clock, and the play goes on at eight. And I was in, I was in real panic and called everybody I could, and nobody could uh, take the gig. And so I called the theater and talked to the director and said, uh, uh, I, I can't make it tonight. Uh, my, my understudy is going to have to go on. And uh, so Sidney <laughs> went on that night. That very night, two scouts from Broadway <laughs> <laughs> came up to Harlem looking for uh, young actors to become part of a play they were going to do on Broadway, uh, one of the great Greek mythologies, uh, Lisa Strata. And they were doing it with an all-black cast. And obviously, uh, seeing Sidney Poitier, uh, they decided that he would be perfect for the young male lead. Mm. And they gave it to him. And uh, that did not sit well with me. <laughs> <laughs> that I should have blown this opportunity <laughs> for these silliest of coincidences and reasons. So he went. And the play ran three nights. Got the worst reviews of any play <laughs> in the history of the theater. And, uh, uh, but on the third night of the play, two other scouts came from Hollywood to find a young black actor to play opposite a young white actor they were grooming to become a big star at 20th Century Fox by the name of Richard Widmark. Mm -hmm. And so Richard Widmark was playing this bad guy. He was in the hospital, and he had to be attended to by a black doctor, which Sidney Poitier was to play. And so they took Sidney to California, gave him a screen test, and the next thing I knew was that Sidney Poitier was not only starred in his first Broadway play, but was now on his way to a Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> and every time I see Sidney, and he begins to boast and feel some, some dance around the fact that he has achieved so much, I had to let him understand that uh, the reason that he has been so celebrated, that he has to understand that all of it is rooted and garbage. <laughs> he, uh, he, uh, he kind of laughs at it now. But uh, throughout the years, Sidney and I have had many an exchange. And I thought, as I was writing the book, that I think the way in which we start the book right. is with a story, uh, Sidney and myself, and an experience that we had with the Ku Klux Klan. And I thought it would be a nice, interesting way to uh, present the book to our readers. So uh, if you all want to know what that story is. Please, share it with us. <laughs> it's on sale outside. <laughs> Very good, Mr. Oh, Belafonte. Very I'm just, good. I'm just being mischievous. <laughs> it's, the, uh, <laughs> are you wanna, would you like to share it? Or, or? Yeah, I'll just do it quickly. Uh, 1964, was it? Yeah. And uh, Sharona Goodman and Cheney were missing from Greenwood, Mississippi. And it was a dark and painful time. 
And I got a call from Greenwood from James, uh, James Foreman, Jim Foreman, who was uh, one of the leaders of SNCC. And he said, we're in a crisis down here. The three civil rights workers are missing. Uh, we have thousands of, uh, really, really hundreds, not thousands, hundreds and hundreds of young students down here with the, with the freedom education, voter education. And uh, hundreds of these young people, mostly white, had come down to help register black people and poor people in the South to get on the scrolls. And many of those students made a contract. And the contract was that they would come down for two weeks or three weeks at the most. And at the end of their ter term of duty, they would go back to the North and attend to the business of getting ready for the fall semester. But the coincidence of that fact was at the time when these three young men were missing. And there was no doubt in our minds that the Ku Klux Klan would turn this exodus of students out of the South going back to the North to attend the new semester. They would not describe it as that. They would describe it as a victory for the Ku Klux Klan that all these young people fled the South uh, in the face of this terror that had been unleashed. And uh, what Jim called about was the fact that many of the students caucused and decided they would stay for the fall semester. If not just a few more weeks, they would stay for the entire semester. And that this required resources. Uh, if you're going to stay down there for that long a time, you're going to need more cars, more fuel, more food, more housing, just a lot of resources. And that they needed to have for the next meeting that was going to take place some way to affirm and to confirm for these young people that resources were available and that they should stay. And Jim calling me said that uh, he would like to know if I could help them raise these funds. And I said, well, how much do you need? And he said somewhere around $100,000, which in those days was, and even now, to tell you the truth. Yeah. But, but you know, back then, that was a hefty sum to try to raise for a cause that was not on everybody's agenda. And uh, I told him I'd do it. And I then had to put all resources on the flow, call people, individuals, got on the phone. And in three days, I raised $70,000, which was as much as they needed at that time. I could get the rest later. Uh, but I would be sending it down. And then discovered I couldn't send it. Because to send that much money through Western Union to a southern branch of the Western Union was an invitation to mischief because any white man sitting down in these Western Union offices, a young black man or a young white student walking in and saying, I'm here to pick up $70,000 in cash, I don't think he would have gotten out of the building or ever be seen again. It was, a, it was not convenient. And no matter what we looked at, it all had difficulties. So I concluded that I would transfer these checks and stuff into cash, fill this satchel like a doctor's bag, and take it down there myself. In the process of doing this, I began to look at the lay of the land. What could possibly happen? And as the scenario began to reveal itself for all that could potentially happen, I decided that uh, I'd be better off if two of us went instead of just one, because uh, uh, I think, you know, they would not hesitate, obviously, at killing a celebrity, but uh, it would be more difficult for them to do to two. And so I did what I always do. I called my best friend. <laughs> and in a tone that was very familiar to him, got on the phone, I said, hey, Sid, yeah, uh, how you doing? I'm doing fine, what's up? Listen, man, what are you doing this weekend? <laughs> Nothing, what's up? Well, I used to call him like that all the time to go off on little trips here, going down 
to the Bahamas and hang out or do something. Mm -hmm. And in this instance, he was ready for fun and games. And I said, well, Sid, uh, I got to make a trip. Yeah, and I'm going down to, to Greenwood, Mississippi. <laughs> and there was this silence. And he said, and what will you be doing <laughs> in Greenwood, Mississippi? And I told him the story. And I said, and I think if both of us went down, it would be kind of cool. If one of us went down, the chances are they'd take a shot. And uh, Sidney listened and, and he said, Harry, let me tell you something. He said, Belafonte, he didn't call me Harry. Belafonte, let me tell you something. I'm going to make this trip. I'll go down with you. And I'll tell you that uh, if we come back, <laughs> there's one thing I want you to understand. I want you to understand this very clearly. Never, ever call me again. <laughs> and we went off. I informed Bobby Kennedy that we were coming, Burke Marshall to Justice Department to make sure everybody was alerted to the two biggest N-words and America was on their way down. In those days, we used it in other ways. But, uh, and uh, Sydney was very uneasy. Well, so was I for that matter. And when we got to the airport to go down, down to Jackson, I told him that I talked to Bobby Kennedy, Justice Department has been alerted. I'm sure we, we will, they'll be safekeeping. And uh, when we got down to Jackson, there was nobody in the airport. Nobody except one black man, elderly, pushing a broom. And Sydney looked at him. And again, looking for the longest time, he says, Belafonte, are you trying to tell me that uh, that's our protection? <laughs> this is Burke Marshall's man? Something's wrong here. <laughs> and so we went on down. I said, no, man. He says, you know, it could very well be. You do movies. Guys get into disguise, they can't let themselves be known. You know, anyway, we got into these, we got into this little plane, went on down to Greenwood, dark, miserable night. I mean, I remember for James Weldon Johnson poem, I mentioned the book uh, called the, the Creation. And he said in it, because uh, it's the first thing I thought of when I saw this black Mississippi night, he says, and God stepped out on space. As far as the eye of God could see, darkness covered everything, blacker than a hundred midnights down by a cypress swamp. And that blackness to me was very profound mm. in its description. And I looked at this Mississippi blackness and I just said, my God, uh, the, the horror of such darkness is uh, really quite a new experience. We got into these two cars which had been brushed down to be to very dull so they would not shine at night because that was the cars that the civil rights workers used. We piled into these two cars, Sidney and I in a back seat, Jim in the front seat, and a guy named Willie Blue driving, and another car. And as we got into these cars in the distance, we saw these headlights going up around the outer parameters of the airstrip. And uh, I said to Sidney, there they are. And Willie Blue said, there who are? And I said, well, you know, FBI and I mean, they're here, he says, man, get it together. That ain't no goddamn FBI. That's the Ku Klux Klan. Mm. And I looked at Sidney, who was in no mu mu mood to hear any witticisms or any remarks. It was just raw terror. And these guys cranked up the motor started the car, and instead of driving away from the headlights, they drove towards them. And they were trying to shine the headlights into the cabin of these trucks and cars to see if they could identify anyone. So that when it left that little area to hit on the highway, they would at least, if anything happened, they'd be able to notify, they'd be able to testify, or at least say what the person looked mm. like. When we got into Greenwood, uh, on our way there, 
a two-way radio called. The people from CORE and SNCC, they came in cars, met us on the highway, and gave us safe keeping. At which time, these pickup trucks and these guys from the Klan began to shoot in the air and beat their rifle butts against the side of these trucks. And I wasn't quite sure what they screamed, but one could assume they were not love letters. And uh, I did not do that for any game playing. It was when I called Sydney, I called him because I genuinely felt the need for him and the kind of impact it would have if the, both of us had gone rather than just one. Mm. And uh, the generosity of his commitment to meet me there uh, did more to give us an indelibility in our friendship than anything else could have. He put it on the line. Uh, we went on our lives, but that's the right. Greenwood well, story. He put it on the line, and, and indeed so did you, Mr. Belafonte. We have a few questions <coughs> from the audience. As a recent graduate of the alma mater of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Morehouse College, I am simply captivated, like the rest of us, by your story. What do you say to those in my generation who, like you and Dr. King, wish to take their conscience to work? I find answering that question a little difficult because The, the richness of the history that I, we've been speaking of, that whole time in America, is filled with so much detail, is filled with so much story, is filled with so many illustrations of courage and smarts. Because a lot of people often refer to divine intervention as a big part of what uh, uh, drove our movement. And although I don't want to challenge that, I would have to say don't defer too much to divine interpretation because uh, there were a lot of courageous men and women who did what they did and did not depend just on the powers of God's wisdom. Dr. King was a man of great learning and he applied that. And when I look at all that was yielded in that struggle to where we now reside, uh, anyone looking for motivation or for answers to questions that plague them about the issues of today need but just flip a page or two back into that history from whence we came. Because almost everything that I look at right here and now is so very much like that time. Mm. Afghanistan. Iraq, not too unlike Vietnam, uh, rebellion in Africa among uh, the people of uh, Tunisia and other places, not too unlike the time of Africans uh, on the move for sovereign dignity and creating their own independence movement on that continent, uh, looking at the kind of loss of purpose our moral compass has become so clouded that we are so caught up in the pandemics of political strategy, we have ignored the fact that something far more important has been lost to us, and that is the nation's sense of moral purpose. We have lost our moral compass. If we ever had it, we have certainly by now lost it. And here's where I find uh, what was significant to our struggle was that almost everything we did was rooted in a moral context, in a moral frame. Dr. King's great power resided in the moral purity of the things that he chose to, to, uh, to challenge the way in which he spoke, the things that he told us was froth with such moral power that even the enemy could not uh, uh, compete. 
the only thing they could resort to in the final analysis was what they resort to all the time, mass murder, assassinations, killings, beatings, violence. And what fascinates me now is that whether it was the demise of the Soviet Union and what happened to communism and what happened in the context between the East and the West or between the Soviets and the capitalists or Soviets and Americans, et cetera, et cetera. It is interesting to me that everybody suspected that any dismantling of communism would carry with it a consequence, no, not the least of which would be nuclear warfare. But interestingly enough, not only was there not a shot fired, but no nuclear warfare, and this transition from what was a totalitarian, cruel, oppressive experience for many Soviets was now transforming itself into a democracy. No violence. Then you go to Mandela and what happened with race. Everybody suspected that once blacks took over the majority rule of South Africa, white citizens would be destroyed just out of the vengeance of black Africans. And yet no such a thing happened. None violence ruled of the day. And then when you take a look at Tunisia and Cairo and so much going on in the world, it's the extent to which nonviolence emerges as not only the most powerful tactic, but also the most powerful moral force at the table. When I look at what's going on with the young people on Wall Street, I am just absolutely rewarded and delighted at the fact that they've chosen to take nonviolence as the tactic of choice. And when anybody says, well, what do they want? There's no leadership. There's no, well, what, what's their purpose? They're just, there's just misfits. And everything rings with such a, a familiarity. You know, when I look back at my life, John Lewis, Julian Bond, Diane Nash, Jesse Jackson, Andy Young were all teenagers. Mm. They were 17 and 18. The oldest person in the back was Martin at 24. Mm. And I was two years older than him. And we really didn't get on his bicycle till he was 26. But you take a look at all that youth and how they emerged from these places that we never heard of. Who knew of Montgomery? Who knew of Rosa Parks? Where did she come from? And this little minister somewhere stuck in a church off in rural south. All of a sudden, he emerged reluctantly to go to a rally and listen to something. And they said, we're glad you're going to show up because it looked funny you're not being at the rally since we're holding it in your church. And there Dr. King emerged. And you look and you see all of this, all these mythical figures just emerge and did so much. What is everybody's dilemma about the current movement? Mm. What is it that these young people are not doing that you all need to hear? What do they need? Do you want some more to get killed? That will come. I remember Kent State. I remember a lot of places where innocent students who stepped into the fray paid with their lives, and the opposition stepped to the table to wreak, its, to wreak their havoc. And when I go down on Wall Street and talk to these young people and they solicit information from me. I'm fascinated at what they say and what they would like to know more about and the way in which they're extending themselves to meet those of us whom I would call the elders to come and sit with them in council and to talk about what they are doing. But I am absolutely filled with the joy that I should have lived this long and come to another moment when young people have risen up in this America to say what they're saying and to do what they will be doing and doing much more of. And I'm fascinated at watching the dilemma on the side of those who wish us ill, those who are our detractors. Uh, uh, it is the best is yet to come, but also the worst of it is yet to be revealed. Mm.
Of all your accomplishments, personal, professional, what do you consider the greatest? What are you most proud of? Well, what I have most benefited by are acts of coincidence and just fleeting moments that were never really expected to be very much that were turned into things that were most profound. Uh, whenever I hear a knock at the door, I never fail to answer that knock because I'm most curious to who is the knocker and what do they want of me. And every time I've answered the door, what has been revealed to me are people of purpose with ideas and thoughts that if I can connect with them can be most beneficial to the spirit, to the heart, to the mind, and to developing a, a set of camaraderie, a set of relationships that yield camaraderie in ways that I would never have known had I not chosen the course that I'm on. And so much of it was out of coincidence. Dr. King called me. I didn't reach for him. I sh perhaps would have and maybe should have earlier. But he called me to say he needed to talk to me. Eleanor Roosevelt called me and said she needed to talk to me. John Kennedy called me through his emissaries and said he needed to talk to me. So each time somebody says they need to talk to you, and you take on the conversation, and this is your reward, well then, I was somebody just tap dance on my door all day long. <laughs> but uh, it was the ability to be able to take advantage of these interventions, these people who called on me to be of some service, when to serve was my willingness, but it was not clearly my objective. Hmm. I wanted to do things to change the way things were because I was born into poverty and I have maintained my relationship to poverty all my life. I am very familiar with it. I am discomforted by its existence, but I'm comfortable with the people who reside there. And wherever I go in the world, you will find poverty. And I feel an empathy with wherever I see this poverty because along with poverty, there is injustice. My mother's counsel to me was never ever go to bed at night knowing that there was something you could do during the day to defy injustice and know that you didn't step to the table. Mm. So with this rather pathetic remark, with this metaphor, I never quite understood what she was talking about until these moments revealed themselves. Uh, yes, uh, I cannot see any act of injustice and not have everything in my total construct become engaged in the act of injustice and my need to participate in doing something about it. Hmm. I'm going to take one more question, and then we want to show. One more. One more. One more, if I may. Because uh, I think it's pretty interesting especially in light of your own uh, life. Do you think young black celebrities now could do more to be positive role models? And if so, what do you suggest? I could answer that question when you said, do you, I think they could do more if I knew what it was that they did. <laughs> It seems to me that, uh, you know, Robeson once said to me, get them to sing your song and they'll want to know who you are. It was the first time he heard me sing, because when he first met me, I was only acting. The next time he saw me in another kind of full-blown way, I had become a singer. 
and he came to see me at the Vanguard, Village Vanguard in New York, and delighted in what he saw, and then encouraged me to continue to pursue that. And he said, get them to sing your song. And then one, I didn't quite understand what all that meant until I woke up one day, and the entire world was singing, Deo, Deo, Daylight come and me want go home. De, me said de, me said de, me said de. And you have never seen anything until you've seen 50,000 Japanese people <laughs> singing Deo. And all that that song was about and all that it encompassed and its journey and its content. And when that record came out and delighted so many people, uh, I had a second round with challenge. What do you do with this platform? What do you do with this much power? What do you do with this much opportunity? What do you use your platform to say? Where do you want to lead these people who have put themselves at your disposal? Because I believe artists are the gatekeepers of truth. I believe we do have a mission and a purpose. Many have stepped into the, into the system of life and have blunted that fact that art has mission and purpose that is far greater than what it has been translated into as just an instrument to entertain and to go make money, and that's the end of it. It is in a blasphemy that that is where that, that power resides. And the question is to artists who have not chosen to take advantage of their celebrity is where resides for you the reward in what you do beyond your bank account? If that is the sum total of the rewards of your mission, then I feel sad for you because you've really missed the best part of life, which is what happens to people when you're in the service of need. And it has a profound impact when you step into that fray. When I walked into Africa and saw all that famine, it overwhelmed me. But the question is, what do you do about it? Mm. Well, I'm an artist. Fine, use the culture and the power of culture. So we go out and did, we are the world. And I call on my buddies and say, you know, I just come from Africa and this, this abandonment of our fellow beings is not only vulgar, but it's, it's, it's really criminal. And this indifference that the world is, and we can do something about it. Let's use our celebrity power. And that collective gave us, we are the world, and everybody got into a feel-good moment. But it, it did a lot to awaken consciousness in people. Well, this fact is replete with opportunity time and time and time again for those who step into the fray. And uh, why these artists don't do it, I can only arrive at one conclusion. They know that there's a price to pay from a material point of view. Because if General Motors doesn't like you, and if uh, some food on the shelf product doesn't like you, you don't do their TV show because they are the sponsors. And if you are blacklisted like some of us have been, you will not appear. And even if you do appear, sometimes if you say the wrong things, you'll be taken off the air, as we discuss in the book, what was done with Revlon and CBS when we got the first Emmy for a show that we did because they didn't like the fact that the cast, not a, not a specific act, but the fact that the cast was integrated, mm. black and white, in the 1960s. We were pulled off the air because I refused to change the makeup of the cast system, the casting system. And I was told by CBS and uh, by Revlon that uh, my services were no longer required. And that lingered. And then what happened with Petula Clark? I did her show, she touched my arm. The account exec sitting in the booth seeing Petula Clark touch my arm was a racial offense beyond his capacity to accept. And uh, he told us that that scene would have to be taken out hmm. of the, and uh, re 
redone. And uh, at 2 o'clock, which was her show, and she was in charge of its production, uh, was confronted with this. And she asked me, what should we do? And I said, Pat, that was her nickname. I said, you know, this is your moment in America. This is your show. This is your platform. These are people who you have reached out to and who have given you a platform. Anything you do that does not sit in rhythm with their expectations of you can be a very costly. And I don't want to take that charge. You do what you think you have to do, and I will go wherever you go in the solution of this. And she says, I want to know what you would do. Right. And I said, from my perspective, I wouldn't let them get away with it. I'd take them on and go public and let them pay the price for what they think is their anonymity. And she said, well, that's exactly what we will do. I will not redo it and let, uh, let the challenge take us where it may. And the next thing we knew, it made headlines in the New York Times. Uh, this guy's name, which was Doyle Lott, was a member of the Lott family from down in the Carolinas. Uh, you've heard of Senator Lott, a very racist, backward man. This was part of his tribe. And the young man who represented uh, the Plymouth Co Motor Car Company was him. And he was the account exec. And when he went on this tirade, we rebelled. And uh, he was fired. And Petula Clark went on to a remarkable career. And uh, I got hired again. Hmm. <laughs> We're going to wrap. Mr. Belafonte, we uh, know that you are going to sign some books. We're going to have to wrap it up though I don't want to because I've enjoyed this conversation. The world is a better place because you stepped in the fray. So we thank you for you. for your life for your commitment, your sacrifice. We have a, another piece of video that we wanted to share with you from the inaugural and pre-inaugural celebration, 1961. And as we let that run, we want to thank you for your song. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Go marching in Yes, when the saints go marching in No oh Lord, I want to be in that number When the saints go marching in Yes, when the saints go marching in Yes, when the saints go marching in No oh Lord, I When the saints go marching in, that's when the saints go marching in. That's when the saints go marching in. The Lord, hearts to shout hallelujah. When the saints go marching in, oh 
excellent job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great working with you. Thank you so much. This was an honor. This was an honor.